quantum computers. Incomprehensible gizmos that work at severely low temperatures and violate our normal logic. Now I'm here, and here I am in a completely different place which is perhaps familiar to you. How do quantum computers actually work, and why are they so difficult to make? This topic is gonna be difficult, but interesting. This is MK, and let us talk about how the most unusual computers in the world work. And we will start with a Rubik's Cube. Yes, a toy for children at first glance, which is more complicated than it seems actually. The classic Rubik's Cube has more than 43 trillion states. This number has 18 zeros in it, it's a billion of billions. By the way, some skillful Asians easily solve it in just a few seconds. Blindfolded. How do they do that? The secret is that you can solve the Rubik's Cube from any state in just 20 moves or even less using precise algorithms. It's just that those Asians make these moves very, very fast. Wait, this is all cool and stuff, but what does the Rubik's Cube have to do with quantum computers? Actually, a lot. Controlling a quantum computer is much like solving a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. The initial state is well known and there is a limited set of basic elements that can be manipulated using a specific set of rules. But if it's so simple, why haven't quantum computers become mass-produced yet? And here the new physics kicks in. The fact is that observing a quantum system during its operation will lead to it becoming classical, and the result of calculations will be incorrect. Yes, it's exactly like with the Schrodinger's cat, who is alive and dead at the same time, only until you look into the box with it. This is why controlling a quantum computer is an extremely difficult task. It is necessary to monitor all possible error factors and at the same time not to monitor the system itself. This is akin to trying to drive from point A to point B with a blindfold, and you can only remove it strictly when you reach point B. And this is not the only unusual feature of quantum computing. The differences with classical computers are at the very core. All the usual computational logic is based on bits, which can take strictly one of two values, 0 or 1. Quantum computers manipulate qubits. And now, fasten your seatbelt, the fun part begins. Qubits have an absolutely non-intuitive quantum mechanical effect called superposition. It allows them to be in a state in which they have a certain number of zeros and a certain number of ones. The coefficients that describe how many zeros and how many ones a qubit has are complex numbers, which means that they have both real and imaginary parts. But that's not all. Scientists have learned to create qubits in a very special way, so that the state of one qubit cannot be described independently of the state of the others. This phenomenon is called entanglement. I think many of you have encountered it when putting on socks. As long as they are not on your feet, it's just two socks. But as soon as one of them is put on your left leg, the second automatically becomes the right one. Okay, let's analyze this quantum logic with a simple example. Take two bits. Together, they can take four values. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And now let's take two qubits. Thanks to the superposition, they can take several states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, at the same time. This is best visualized by this animation, where one bit is two points, 0 or 1, and a qubit is essentially a sphere of possible states between 0 and 1. So what is the advantage? It is the fact that n qubits work with information in the same way as two in a degree of n bits. In other words, just 10 qubits replace 1024 bits, and to replace just 100 qubits, you will need so many ordinary bits that this number would have 30 zeros in it. For comparison, all of humanity generates only a few dozen zettabytes of information per year. It is this unrealistic efficiency of quantum computing that encourages the largest companies and universities to develop this new type of computer. But let's go back to the complexity of calculations, and yes, let's talk about the Rubik's Cube again. The fact is that the operations performed on qubits are very similar to the rotations of a Rubik's Cube, and even the errors are similar, although in the case of the cube, they appear immediately. If you don't finish the turn completely, making the next turn will be impossible. The problems with quantum computing are similar. They are not perfect either. Due to certain limitations of control signals and the sensitivity of qubits, 
An operation that's supposed to rotate our hypothetical cube by 90 degrees may eventually rotate it by 90.1 degrees, or 89.9 degrees. It would seem that such errors are insignificant, but they accumulate quickly, which eventually leads to a completely incorrect calculation result. There are other sources of errors, for example, such a phenomenon as decoherence. The old timers remember that floppy disks would lose information over time due to demagnetization. Qubits have a similar problem. Although they try to make them as isolated from the environment as possible, interactions with it still occur. And they, of course, destroy the quantum entanglement and lead to data loss. Of course, scientists have come up with quantum error correction, but it only requires even more qubits to implement, which turns into a vicious circle. But if all these problems and difficulties have not scared you off, it's time to make a drawing of the key. I mean, a quantum computer. Engineers and scientists have sensibly reasoned that it makes sense to divide such a complex contraption into five levels. The first two are already familiar to us. At the application level, there is essentially an operating system that allows a person to interact with a quantum computer. At a lower level of classical processing, human-readable instructions are translated into machine code so that a quantum computer can work with them as well as calculated result is reverse translated into the application level. In fact, there is no big difference with the classic PC here, so let's go deeper into the rabbit hole. This is where the new and unknown begins, namely the quantum processing unit, or QPU. The first two levels in it are responsible for digital and analog processing. Their goal is to convert machine code into special signals that will turn qubits into quantum logic elements. The digital level is also responsible for collecting results and sending them to the classical processing level. And at this moment, there is an important cutoff point. Now, powerful supercomputers can theoretically cope with all the tasks mentioned earlier. But when error correction is added to the quantum computers, the level of digital data processing will become much more complicated and it will no longer be possible to emulate it on classical machines. But let's go back to our drawing of a quantum computer. So, the analog data processing level works with the lowest quantum level, which is where the qubits are. But how to interact with them? This is where the extreme mathematics and physics begin. To create an entanglement effect, microwave impulses are sent to the qubits, which are modulated in phase and amplitude with picosecond accuracy. For a better understanding of this time interval, an airplane flying at a speed of 1000 km per hour will have time to travel only a millionth of a millimeter. And this is just one of the difficulties. In systems with dozens of qubits, you need to make them perform various actions, for which each of them are tuned to their own frequency. In this case, each qubit can be represented as a radio receiver. If you want to send data to it, tune into its frequency and do so. This strategy actually works as long as there are few qubits. But let's imagine a hypothetical quantum computer with a million qubits. Each of them is tuned to its own frequency, and in order to cut off the noise and transmit enough data, we will allocate a bandwidth of, say, 10 MHz to each of them. Then a bandwidth of 10 terahertz will be required for all qubits combined, which is far beyond our radio capabilities which have barely reached hundreds of gigahertz. Although I must say, a possible solution here lies on the surface. All thanks to mobile communications, which have long faced the problem with huge number of people at one place, eager to get online. We are talking about a combination of frequency and spatial multiplexing, that is, channel densification. The idea is that you can use the same frequency for several qubits or groups of qubits at the same time, transmitting data for each of them at certain intervals. And the last problem is temperature. For a quantum computer to work, temperatures near absolute zero are required to preserve the effect of superconductivity when the resistance of the conductors is zero. And the problem is that as quantum computers develop, there is a desire to cram all three layers of the QPU block into one cryogenic chip, to which the modern semiconductor industry so far says an emphatic no. But at the present moment, in computers with a dozen qubits, it is enough that only the quantum processing level, which is where the qubits are, should be operated at extremely low temperatures. So, congratulations! We have just completed the drawing of the simplest quantum computer. These are the principles that they are using now. What are they capable of? 
They can entangle a dozen qubits for 50 microseconds, after which the calculations will drown in errors. This is not enough to create a full-fledged computer. And even if we continue to scale the current principles, the limit will be about 100 qubits. This is enough to create a kind of compute and accelerator for an ordinary computer, like a graphics card that trains neural networks or renders videos significantly faster than conventional CPUs. Only in this case, the quantum accelerator will be great at solving cryptography tasks. But we don't just want an accelerator, right? What is required to create a full-fledged independent quantum computer with hundreds of thousands and even millions of qubits? Of course, error correction is needed. The thing is that each qubit is a personality with its own character. They have inhomogeneities, which we can correct manually, as long as we're working with just a couple dozen qubits. But what if there are several orders more of them? We can go from physical qubits to logical ones. Take several hundred and even thousands of qubits, call some of them correctional, and collectively call them a logical qubit. This kills two birds with one stone. First, the state of correction qubits allows you to track and correct errors that occur. Second, such a combination of qubits will significantly reduce the required number of digital connections to the QPU, since now the control will take place at a higher logical level. But we're still talking about huge amounts of information. It will be necessary to monitor the state of millions of qubits thousands of times per second without violating the quantum state of the system and simultaneously correcting errors. This will require a shared data bus with a bandwidth of petabytes per second, which is tens of times more than the current internet data transfer speed records. And these are the fundamental problems of expanding the capabilities of quantum computers, which are holding us back at the level of tens of qubits. But given the fact that many scientists around the world are working on these problems, sooner or later a breakthrough is bound to happen and full-fledged quantum computers with millions of qubits will become a reality. I hope you enjoyed it. We have simplified this topic as much as we could, omitted many nuances and tried to make it simple. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe to us. This was MK. My name is Mikhail Kroshin. Bye.